Good evening. It's 8 o'clock in Yerushalayim. This is webyeshiva.org, and it's time to begin our series of Shi'urim on Aramaic grammar for Tanakh and Targum. Uh, before I begin, let me make some preliminary uh, announcements. If you have any questions in the course of the Shi'ur, feel free to uh, uh, type your question on chat, and I will see your question appear on my screen. Then I can incorporate the answer into the uh, into the shiur. Uh, uh, all the shiurim will be available to participants on archive, recorded versions, video and video and audio. The the archive version appears around 24 hours after the real shiur is finished. And if you miss a shiur and want to pick it up on archive, feel free to visit the uh, uh, the uh, Web Yeshiva internet site and uh, the, go to our class page and you can download download the archived video from there. If you want to ask me a question regarding one of the archived shiurim, feel free to send me an email. I'll type my email on the screen now. Uh, there, there you've got it on your chat box. Feel free to send me an email. If you have any questions regarding the uh, uh, regarding the uh, uh, archived shiur, <clears throat> I know that not all of the participants are from English-speaking countries. So let me point out that uh, if it's easier for you to type a question in another language, uh, on peut poser des questions en français. Uh, man kann fragen, ruhig, ruhig auf Deutsch stellen. Se puede, se, se puede, se puede hacer preguntas también en español. Uh, I have a number of other languages. Uh, if you need some other language, let me know. Maybe I can handle another language as well. Uh, I've opened up on your screen. I hope it appears on your screen. I've opened up a notes panel where you are free to uh, to take notes, uh, if you wish, using your keyboard in the course of the class. Just make sure you save your notes after you click the Save button uh, in order to be able to, to save them. Okay, those are the introductory technical points. Now, let's begin the material itself. Uh, the Aramaic language, which we're going to be dealing with in this series, is uh, by far the world's greatest language in terms of geographical scope and chronological scope. Uh, Aramaic was the language from Gibraltar all the way to India, uh, it was the language which was in use already in the days of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and continues uh, to be a language still in use today. Um, the, uh, uh, there is no other language in the world which corresponds as far into, in terms of geographical scope and chronological scope to Aramaic. Now, the Jewish dialects of Aramaic, which we are concentrating on, obviously, are basically a subcategory of what they call Persian Imperial Aramaic, the Aramaic of the Persian Empire. Uh, Aramaic was the official language of the Persian Empire, which was vast. And the Persian Empire, of course, included many lands of different languages. Aramaic was the official language of the Aramaic, of the uh, Persian Empire. And the, the Jewish dialects, which we are going to be studying, are basically a subcategory of that the um, uh, the, uh, 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 the specific areas which we're going to deal with are biblical Aramaic. Of course, the Bible of Tanakh is mostly in Hebrew. Everyone knows that. But scattered here and there throughout the Tanakh, there are a few Aramaic passages. And we're going to be looking at those Aramaic passages very carefully. Uh, the reason the biblical Aramaic passages are so precious to us is because the vocalization the vowels are preserved, and everyone knows how exquisitely precise the scribes were, generation after generation, to copy the text of Tanakh with exquisite precision. And therefore, even though we find in later Aramaic texts, like the Talmud and the Targum, for example, where you find a lot of misspellings, and indeed, 
you can find the same word spelled differently, uh, spelled a few different ways on the same page, uh, unlike the, uh, the later Aramaic texts like Talmud and the Targumim, where, where scribes were not as exquisitely precise in copying the material, therefore mistakes, mistakes uh, arise. One can learn the grammar, the correct grammar, as it was actually used in those days through the biblical text. And then it's fairly easy to deal with the uh, errors and the, the mistakes, the misspellings, and the mistakes which you find in the later texts. Uh, after all, anyone who is learning English or any foreign language, if you learn the standard language first, then it's very easy to deal with the slang, with the mistakes that crop up all the time. Uh, someone who has learned to speak English and learns that the correct way to formulate a question is, uh, did you eat? Did you eat yet? Would be the correct way to formulate a question. Anyone who learns that will pick up pretty quickly what is meant if you hear an English speaker ask, jeet, jeet yet? Uh, whereas if you start learning the colloquial way, if what you are taught initially is jeet, jeet yet, to get from there back to the correct form, did you eat yet? It's not so simple. So it's, it's much easier. It's much easier to start with the uh, biblical Aramaic, and then and then the the other forms are much easier to work with rather than the other way around. Let's uh, let's begin with uh, two words of Aramaic, which appear in Sefer Breshit, in the Hall of Chumash. In the Hall, hall of Chumash and the Hall of Nach, uh, well, not true, in the Hall of Chumash and the Hall of Nevi'im, these are the only two words of Aramaic which appear, so we can be complete here. It says, it says in Sefer Breshit, Vayikra, uh, Vayikra lo Lovin, Lovin called to him, uh, called to it, Lovin called it Yagar Sahadusa, a heap, a pile of, uh, of testimony. Uh, the Yaakov Karalo and Yaakov called it Gal Ed, which in Hebrew means the same thing. What happened in the story? Everyone knows the story. Yaakov and Lovin made an agreement. In order to memorialize the agreement, in order to commemorate the agreement, they built a heap of stones. That's the way they memorialized the agreement they made between themselves. And of course, Lovin, who was an Aramaic speaker, called that heap of stones Yagar Sahadusa, Yagar Sahaduta, a heap of stones in Aramaic. The, uh, and Yaakov Avinu, who was a speaker of Hebrew, called exactly the same thing with the Hebrew expression Gal Ed. So Gal Ed means Yagar Sahaduta, and Yagar Sahaduta means Gal Ed. So, so we, we've learned one word, Yagar, which is, the truth be told, not the most commonly occurring word in the Aramaic language. It means a heap or a pile. It's a nice word to know. But a far more important word is the Sahaduta. Sahaduta, wit uh, test testimony or witness. That's an important word, testimony. Now, of course, in, uh, as you can see in the biblical text, the word is written with a, uh, a sin, uh, whereas in later texts, it appears with a samich. Well, this is just, uh, of course, very common to have a change in spelling from the earlier texts to the later texts. Think about English as it was spelled uh, 200 years ago, uh, 300 years ago. Of course, of course, there have been a lot of changes in spelling. And this is one of the changes which occurred in Aramaic. But uh, sahad, samich, hey, dalad. That root is a very important root occurring over and over and over again in Jewish Aramaic literature. The root means witness or, or testimony. Uh, a very common phrase is anan. We, sahade, we testify. We'll, we'll learn the structure of this phrase a little bit later, but anan, sahade, we testify is a very common Talmudic expression. Uh, it's used when the Bet Din, the court, does not have actual testimony before it, but the judges know the facts. Now, in general, 
uh, witnesses or documentary evidence has to be brought before the court in order to prove whatever whatever has to be proved. But sometimes the court itself knows the facts, and therefore you don't actually need uh, need uh, uh, any testimony. Well, uh, it's true that Rav Hirsch uh, did assert that sin and samach are interchangeable. But that's a, a can of worms that we're not going to open up at this time. At uh, this time, it's enough to know that there have been spelling changes in the Aramaic language. Same thing in Hebrew, there have been spelling changes. The um, uh, Sahad, if you have a, if you have a case before the court, uh, which revolves around loans which were made and repaid on different days, and there's some kind of disagreement between the borrower and the lender, and one of the things the court has to know is the uh, exchange rates on different days. Well, you know, if the court knows the exchange rates, you don't have to bring witnesses to tell the court what the exchange rates were if they happen to know the facts themselves. Anan Sahade, although a, a, a judge in general cannot be a witness in the case before him, uh, if it's just a question of establishing uh, certain facts, which everyone knows, the court is entitled to say, Anan Sahade, we the judges testify that such and such is true. Everyone knows that such and such is true. You don't have to bring witnesses to prove that something obviously is correct. Now, uh, uh, all the Semitic languages, as you know, are closely related. Uh, in Arabic, the word shahid is a witness, and uh, uh, shahid is a martyr in Aramaic. Shahid, someone who gives testimony to the Muslim faith, is a shahid, a witness to the Muslim faith. That's a martyr, someone who gets killed for his Islamic faith. And a shahid is a witness in a, uh, in a law court in Arabic. But all these languages are closely related. Now, as far as uh, Sefer Breshi, as far as the whole of Chumash is concerned, that's it. Those are the two Aramaic words. Uh, let's, uh, uh, let, let, let's go to the book of Daniel, where we really have a connected Aramaic text. And here we can really begin to learn the structure of the different forms which are employed. In, in the second chapter of Sefer Daniel, it says that in the second year of the kingdom, of, ne uh, of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had a dream, and uh, his, uh, his uh, spirit was mightily upset by the dream, and uh, he couldn't sleep because of this dream he had. The king said, call all of the magicians, uh, call all of the magicians and the dream interpreters, I want to tell the dream interpreters my dream, the king said. Well, they all came. All, 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 all the dream interpreters and the magicians of the court came at the behest of the king, and they stood before the king. Then the king said to the magicians and the dream interpreters, Chalom chalamti, I dreamt a dream. V'tipaim ruhi, and my, my spirit is mightily upset. I want to know the meaning of the dream, the king told the magicians. The Adabru HaKazdim and the Kazdim, the Arameans, uh, Kazdi means Arama the Aramaic-speaking magicians, answered the king, Aramit, in the Aramaic language. And from now on, in the biblical text of Daniel, we have the discussion between the king and the magicians, the Kazdim, the Aramaic-speaking magicians, from this point on in the book of Daniel, we have the text in the original Aramaic language. Sefer Daniel has switched from Hebrew into Aramaic as it gives the direct quotations from the discussions between Nebuchadnezzar the king and his court magicians, all of whom spoke Aramaic. Here is what the magicians, the Kazdim, said. Malka, first we'll translate it, and then we'll go back through it again, word by word, to understand the structure of each word. They said, Malka, O king, Malka, O king, l'alamin hai forever live. O king, may you live forever. O king, forever live. Emar chalma, say the dream, l'avdach, to your servants, 
say the dream to your servants, tell us your dream, in other words, Ufishra, and the meaning, the interpretation, we will say. So this is the opening phrase in Aramaic, spoken by the Aramaic uh, magicians to King Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, King, live forever, uh, say the dream to your servants, and the interpretation we will say. Let's now go back through it one step at a time and understand what's going on here. Uh, the, the first words in the, uh, which they say is Malka, uh, which I translated, O King. Now everyone knows that Melech is the ordinary word for king. That's well known. And the Aleph at the end the Aleph at the end is the definite article. Definite article is what linguists, what grammarians call the. The word the is an Aleph at the end of the at the end of the word. Melech, king, Malka, the king. Now Malka, the king, is also used for what linguists or, or grammarians call the vocative when you want to speak to someone directly. In in older English, we would say, O oh, king. Uh, that O oh, at the beginning means we're speaking directly to the person. In in Aramaic, as in Hebrew, you use the definite article, Aleph at the end, or in Hebrew, Ha at the beginning, to indicate that you're speaking directly to someone. In Hebrew, here in Israel, if someone wants to speak to me, they might very well want to get my attention by addressing me as Harav, Harav, Yesh li she'ela. Harav, Harav, Yesh li she'ela. Oh Rabbi, oh Rabbi, I have a question. The use of the definite article, the, in Harav, indicates the vocative, I'm speaking directly to the person, and in Aramaic, the Aleph at the end accomplishes the same purpose. Now, uh, 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 you have to understand that every word in the Aramaic language, every noun in the Aramaic language, but a noun is a person, a place, or a thing, every noun, person, place, or thing in the Aramaic language has three forms. Uh, there's uh, the basic form, which, uh, 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 for example, a law, the word din means a law, a law, din, a law. That's your basic form. Then you have what they call the construct state. Uh, how do you say a law of? Well, it's the same. Din can mean either a law or it can mean the law of. Uh, take another word, like melech. A melech is a king. Malka, well, we haven't come to Malka. Melech is a king or the king of. Melech, a king, or melech, the king of. You, you put an aleph at the end, and you'll get Dina, the law. Put an aleph at the end of Melech, and you get Ma, Malka, the uh, the king. Malka, the king. And that's all there is to it. Now, let me point out that in the course of time, uh, spelling changes occurred. And this final aleph that you see, indicating the word the, indicating the definite article, uh, could very well change into a final hey. Uh, you have to get used to the flexibility in spelling, and therefore a final hey at the end for Malka is just a spelling variation of, uh, of Malka with an aleph at the end, meaning the king. Melech, a king, or Melech, the king of, Malka, the king. What could be simpler? Now, in the plural, the endings are a little bit different. In plural, laws are dinim. Everyone knows that. In Hebrew, dinim with a mem at the end. In Aramaic, dinim with a nun at the end. Uh, that, that's simple enough, and I suppose is well known. Uh, the law of, uh, no, no, the laws of dine, uh, just like in Hebrew, dine. Ha-melech would be Hebrew. Dine ha-melech, the laws of the king. Dine malka, uh, the laws of the king in Aramaic. Dine malka. Now, the plural laws, the laws in plural, we get two possibilities. The plural could be either dinaya, 
meaning the laws, or dine, which just looks like the law of, it's spelled exactly the same, but uh, dinaya, or dine, means uh, the laws. The difference between these two forms turns out to be terribly important. Remember that the Jews came to Babylonia the first time in the, in the uh, first temple period, uh, and uh, that was the first expulsion of the Jews from Eretz Yisrael, and they came to, to Babylonia, where the Jews lived for a few generations until they came back to Eretz Yisrael with Ezra. Uh, the Jewish community of Babylonia existed from that time down to you know, more or less the present. Uh, there, there might still be a, few, a handful of Jews in Babylonia, I doubt it, but, but, but surely until just a few years ago, that community in Babylonia, what they call today Iraq, uh, the Iraqi Jewish community uh, flourished from the days of the first temple until just a few years ago. Uh, whenever I read the headlines in the newspaper about uh, how many people are being killed in, uh, in Iraq today, how happy I am that the Jews no longer live there. They would, of course, be the first victims in any kind of violence which occurs. But that's a, uh, let's look at the language. Uh, since the Jews lived in Babylonia, from the first temple period until modern times, there are differences in dialect between the Aramaic of Eretz Yisrael, which is Western Aramaic, and the dialect of Aramaic in Babylonia, which is Eastern Aramaic. The differences are not great, very slight differences, rather like the differences between American English and British English. If you know one, you understand the other pretty well, occasionally you'll have a little bit of difficulty, but the, 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 the differences are relatively small and they're mutually intelligible. The plural form, dinaya, <clears throat> dinaya, that was the plural form in Eretz Yisrael. That was the plural form for the laws in Eretz Yisrael in Western Aramaic texts. Dine was the plural form in Babylonia in the Western texts. Yeah, so the Yerushalmi Talmud, for example, as you correctly point out, the Yerushalmi Talmud uh, is from Eretz Israel, and there the plural endings are Aya. In the Babylonian Talmud, the, uh, which is from Babylonia, the, uh, the plural endings are A. Dine is typical in the Babylonian Talmud, Dinaya, typical in uh, the Palestinian Talmud. Now, we know, of course, the Babylonian Talmud not rarely quotes Hachamim from Eretz Yisrael. And when Hachamim from Eretz Yisrael are quoted in the Babylonian Talmud, then of course they're going to be speaking in, in Eretz Yisrael dialect. So you do get occasionally the ayah ending in the Babylonian Talmud, but there you know you are reading the text which came from Eretz Yisrael to Babylonia. The other way around is extremely, extraordinarily rare. It's uh, very rare that the Yerushalmi quotes Chachamim from Babylonia, so you don't find it going the other direction very often. Now this is, of course, uh, uh, terribly important to know, because not always does the text before you tell you who the speaker is. And sometimes you, you have to figure out yourself who the speaker is. Uh, the, the plural forms are a good, a good point of uh, departure. The, 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 the plural forms will indicate to you at least whether the author of the words, the speaker of the words, comes from the east or the west, from Eretz Yisrael or from Babylonia. That, 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 that's very important. So, dinin, laws, dine, the laws of, or in Babylonia the same thing means the laws, dinaya, the laws in Eretz Yisrael. Sure, uh, we're going to be seeing Targumim later in, the, uh, uh, later in this mini semester, and we'll see some Targumim are of Eretz Yisrael origin, and not surprisingly, the halachic material embedded in Eretz Yisrael Targumim or Midrashim correspond with the Yerushalmi, and the other way around, uh, Targumim from Babylonia have, uh, have plenty of halachic material embedded in them, and they of course correspond in large with the opinions of the Babli, where there are disagreements. Up until now, all the examples I've given are masculine nouns. Din, a law, melech, a king. These are masculine, uh, masculine words, and uh, 
as you know, every language in every Semitic language is either masculine or feminine with variations in the endings, depending upon which it is. As far as the feminine endings are concerned, here's how it works. Uh, Mila is feminine. In Hebrew, the word Mila means a word. But in Aramaic, the, uh, uh, the word Mila can mean a word, and it does mean a word in Aramaic, but more commonly, the word Mila in Aramaic means a thing, a thing. If you think about it for a moment, you realize that the Hebrew word davar, the ordinary Hebrew word for a thing, really comes from the root having to do with saying something. It has come, comes from the same root, which refers to words. But uh, in Hebrew, davar more commonly means a thing. In Aramaic, mila more commonly means a thing. And uh, uh, mila would, then, would therefore be a thing. Uh, a, a, a thing of milat and the thing milta milta uh, the, the, the taf because it's feminine the a ah at the end because it's definite the milta in the plural feminine plural the feminine plural ending in Hebrew is ot right uh, uh, bat is a girl banot are girls in Hebrew uh, gidola gidolot Ot is the plural ending in Hebrew, but the plural ending in Aramaic is a nun, milan, things, milan, things. Um, the things of milat. And here, horror of horrors, since most of our Aramaic texts are written without vowels, milat, a thing, uh, 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 milat, the thing of, and milat, the things of, singular and plural, the thing of, and the things of, are spelled exactly the same. The only difference is a minor difference in vowel, which of course, if you have the vowels omitted in an unvocalized text, in an, in an unvocalized text, leads you to try to figure out whether or not the word before you is bilat, the law of, the thing of, or bilat, the things of. And that you have to figure out yourself. Uh, as far as the plural is concerned, um, the milta uh, 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 we know is the word singular, the thing singular, and the plural horror of horrors is milata, spelled exactly the same way without vowels, and therefore if you have the word milta or milata without vowels, you have to figure out yourself whether it is milta, the thing or milata, the things. And it's often not obvious one way or another uh, which is the correct uh, vocalization. And that's something you, know, you have to figure out yourself when you encounter these, uh, these uh, uh, ambiguous uh, places. Uh, in, in Babylonia, the, the, the non-Jews in Babylonia, who spoke Aramaic as well, uh, the non-Jews in Babylonia did us a favor that in their texts, in the non-Jewish Aramaic texts, whenever the word was plural, they put two dots over the word. Two dots on top of the word meant the word was plural. But that's what the non-Jews in Babylonia did. But the Jews did not do that. And if you have an unvocalized text, you're left to figure out yourself whether a word before you is milta, the word, or milata, the words. Now, uh, one other point has to be made here. Everything I've said about the endings on nouns is absolutely true with respect to biblical Aramaic. However, in the course of time, the ah ending, meaning the, the ah ending for the definite article became frozen onto words. And in the course of time, every noun just automatically had the ah ending added to it, regardless of whether it meant the or a. Uh. So although in the earlier texts, we have rigorous differentiation between a law and the law, in later texts, like Talmudic texts, dina is the only form that appears, and uh, sometimes it means the law, and sometimes it means a law. Now, this change 
in the course of time where the ah ending, the aleph ending, became frozen on the words and it's just always added regardless of any meaning. This was a slow change that occurred in the course of time. In the earlier texts, namely biblical texts that we're starting with, we'll see that the ah ending means definite article. Absence of the ah ending means no definite article. Later, in a few weeks, when we come to later texts, we'll begin to see the, the change as we go from century to century. Now, uh, there are a number of words, just to illustrate to you the problem here uh, 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 of, how, of how difficult the whole matter gets. In, in, in Koribon, which many people sing uh, on Shabbat, there's a phrase, Hevat uh, Bara, the animal of the outside. Hevat Bara, right? Heva is an animal. Hevat, the animal of. Hevat bara, the animal of the outside. Bara, bar, outside. Bara, the outside. Uh, in English, we would say wild, the wild animal. The wild animal. Hevat uh, bara, the animal of the outside. The ofe shemaya, and the birds of the sky. Right? Uh, of, a bird, same as in Hebrew. Uh, ofe, the birds of. Shmaya, the sky, right? Ofe, the birds of. Shmaya, the sky. Ofe, Shmaya, the birds of the sky. Now, of course, since the text is unvocalized through the centuries, and today in your Siddur, I understand you have vowels, but the question is exactly how should it be vocalized? If you have a patach under the vav, then that makes the word hevat singular the animal of the outside, the wild animal, and the birds of the skies. If, at exactly the same word, you put a kamat, that makes it plural. And uh, uh, it would mean the wild animals, the animals of the outside and the birds of the sky. Uh, since since the, the poet gave us the birds in the plural, that's obviously plural, ofe, then it surely makes sense that the first word also be plural. And therefore, it's, it makes sense that the correct vocalization is with a kamat under the vav in traditional Ashkenaz pronunciation, chevos bora, chevos bora, the ofe shemaya. Now, this traditional Ashkenaz pronunciation, which distinguishes between patach, a, and comet, a, this traditional Ashkenaz pronunciation was the pronunciation of ancient Babylonia. The Jews who were in Babylonia pronounced every patah, ah, and every comet's ah, and this, in the course of time, corresponds exactly with the traditional Ashkenaz pronunciation. This is true both in Hebrew and Aramaic. The Jews in Babylonia didn't speak Hebrew on a day-to-day -day basis, but when they read from the Torah, when they recited their prayers, every patah would be an ah, every uh, comet would be an ah, exactly uh, as contemporary Ashkenaz pronunciation is. The contemporary Sephardic pronunciation, in which both patah and kamat are pronounced identically, ah in ah, this was the pronunciation in Eretz Yisrael, and uh, uh, the, the contemporary Sephardic pronunciation corresponds exactly with the way Hebrew and Aramaic was pronounced in Eretz Yisrael. Now, as far as the split in pronunciation is concerned between Aramaic, as, Aramaic or Hebrew as it was pronounced in Babylonia and Hebrew or Aramaic as it was pronounced in Eretz Yisrael, whether it should be ah, ah, or ah, or, for patach comets, this, uh, this uh, variation in pronunciation goes back to the earliest sources we have in the days of Tanakh, uh, which represents a more ancient tradition, earlier than, uh, than the writings of Tanakh from the days of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. When the Jews came out of Egypt, there's no way to know uh, whether Moshe Rabbeinu 
and the people, the Jews coming out of Eretz Yisrael, used the Eretz Yisrael pronunciation or the Babylonian pronunciation as, as a question which is up for grabs. Linguists would love to know the difference, uh, to, to know which pronunciation is the older pronunciation. But uh, as far as historical records are concerned, uh, both the uh, both the uh, pronunciation of Babylonia and the pronunciation of Eretz Yisrael, the eastern and western, are of equal antiquity as far as uh, the known sources are concerned. And therefore, the Ashkenaz and the Sephardic tradition are of equal are of equal age as far as is known today. Uh, well, let's consider a, a very common word, a very important word, the word mechila. I've written it with a hey at the end, uh, but of course you'll find it also with an aleph at the end in Aramaic. Uh, mechila with an aleph at the end or a hey at the word. Hey at the end means measure. In Hebrew, the word is mida. And as you know. Every midrash uh, 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 corresponding with the five books of Moses, every midrash on every book of the Chumash has a different name. The, uh, uh, the midrash on Sefer Shmot, the, the, the midrash on the book of Exodus, is called, I don't know how to pronounce the word, but there you have it spelled. Uh, the word, the midrash on, uh, on Sefer Shmot, on Exodus, is spelled in this way. Well, this is usually pronounced, people in the yeshiva world anyway, usually call, call it the mechilta, the mechilta. Uh, but if you think about it for a moment, uh, Sefer Shmot, the book of Exodus, has a lot of measures in it, tons of measures, measures in the plural, and therefore a better pronunciation for the name of the Midrash would probably be mechilata, mechilta, the measure, Mechilata, the measures, and uh, given the content of Sefer Shemot, given the content of the book of Exodus, Mechilata with the uh, plural form is probably, uh, probably makes more sense. In any event, we're familiar with the plural ending from the, the, the prayer book, called Birchata, all of the blessings, Shirata, the songs, plural, Tushpechata, praises, plural, Nehamata, consolations, plural, the Amran Baalma, uh, which are said in the world. Uh, that's the Ata ending for plural, Ta ending for singular in the feminine. Let's go on uh, to the next point. Lang cognate languages, languages which are very similar to each other, uh, have, of course, a lot of similar words uh, with minor variations between them. Uh, in uh, in English, we have the color blue. Uh, in, in German, the same color is blau. Uh, in Yiddish, the same color is bloy. You, know, you hear the similarity between cognate languages, blue, blau, bloy. Minor variations from one language to the other in similar, in similar words. If you speak a, a cognate language of, of English, then you're familiar with this and you, uh, you become accustomed to it very, very quickly. Here is an important rule to remember. This rule will explain to you a huge number of words in Aramaic. But where in Hebrew we have an O vowel, in Aramaic you will typically have an A vowel. That's a very typical phonetic shift between Hebrew and Aramaic. Aramaic A, corresponds with Hebrew O. Let's see a few examples, and you'll know how it works. The word for world in Hebrew is olam. In Aramaic, alam. Shalom means peace in Hebrew. Shlam in Aramaic. Shlom, shlam. Enosh is a human in, English, in Hebrew. Enosh, a, a human in Aramaic. Dor, a generation in Hebrew. Dar, a generation in Aramaic. Think about the Babylonian pronunciation. There's not, a, not, so, not such a big difference, right? In the Babylonian pronunciation, Dor in Hebrew, Dor in Aramaic, Dor and Dor. Yeah, you know, almost exactly the same because in, 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 the, in the Babylonian pronunciation, the comet was pronounced aw, just like in the traditional Ashkenaz pronunciation. So these are closer if you look at it in the Babylonian pronunciation. 
a little bit further apart if you look at it in the, in the Palestinian pronunciation. The number three in Hebrew is shalosh. In Aramaic, talat. Uh, we'll talk about the shin shifting into a taf on another occasion, but uh, it's enough here to notice that the old vowel shifts into an ah. The present tense in Hebrew is kotev. The present tense in Aramaic is katev. And horror of horrors, when you write katev in Aramaic without vowels, it looks exactly like katav, the past tense. And therefore, when you see katav, or uh, an extremely common word is amar, that might be past tense, katav, or might be present tense, katev, uh, in Aramaic, is spelled exactly the same. Yeah, sure. Uh, the Hebrew word for no or not is a lo. Everyone knows that. In Aramaic, la. Uh, of course, they're spelled exactly the same without vowels. And therefore, in the Yeshiva world, people are not so familiar with the correct pronunciation. In the Yeshiva world, many people are saying lo when they read Talmudic texts as well. But it really should be la. A, a, a priest is a kohen. Looks the same pattern as a present tense verb, right? Like kotev. In Aramaic, a priest is a kahen, and to this day, both kohen and kahen are fairly common family names of uh, Jews from the priestly family. Kohen, the Hebrew form, and kahen, the uh, the Aramaic form. If you speak Russian, uh, or if you listen to Russians speak Hebrew, or if you listen to Russians speak uh, English, you, 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 you might notice that in the Russian language, there is no hey, no sound corresponding with hey. In the Russian language, there's no sound corresponding with the H in English. And therefore, for many Russian speakers, it's difficult for them to learn how to pronounce the hey sound in Hebrew or the, uh, the H sound in English. And therefore, uh, 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 you get very commonly uh, uh, changes, phonetic changes along the following lines. Uh, the family name Horowitz, with a hey or an H at the beginning, is very commonly pronounced in, in Eastern Yiddish, Jews from Russia, very commonly transform exactly the same family name Horowitz into Gurowitz, uh, uh, the capital of, uh, of the Czech Republic, is today called in Czech, the Czech name of the, of the capital of the Czech Republic is Praha. Uh, in, uh, in Russian, exactly the same city is called Praga. Well, in English, too, Prague with a G. Uh, that's the, 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 the eastern, uh, more Russian pronunciation word. Kniha in Czech, Kniha in, in, in Russian is the ordinary word for book. Uh, therefore, a great rabbi like Yisroel Meir, the author of the Mishnah Bura, could have the family name Kagan, when in point of fact he was from a priestly family, uh, a Kohen, Kahen, and Kagan, being the, uh, the Eastern pronunciation in Europe, are all forms of exactly, exactly the same word. Um, uh, let's look at a few more examples and we'll see how this works. In Hebrew, the word kum means to stand up, to rise. In Aramaic, exactly the same word means to be standing. Uh, in Hebrew, omed. Right? In Hebrew, there's a difference between kam, to stand up, and omed, to be standing. Uh, in, uh, in Hebrew, kam means to stand up. In Aramaic, exactly the same word, means like in Hebrew, omed, to be standing. Well, we know that the present tense in Hebrew has the pattern kotev, and we know that the present tense in Aramaic has the pattern katev, o in Hebrew, a in Aramaic, and therefore the present tense of someone he is standing is ka'em. Ka'em, and we're going to see this word in the biblical text pretty soon. It's in Daniel, uh, chapter 2, verse 31. Ka'em, hu ka'em, he is standing. The Aleph 
is added to the middle of the word, even though there's no aleph in the root, in order to be able to get the vowel pattern correctly, for the present tense, you need in Hebrew O, A. In Aramaic, for the present tense, you need the pattern A, A. In order to get that pattern, you need an Allah from the middle of the word Ka'em, means he is standing. Now, now the Allah, in the course of time, lost its pronunciation. What on earth does that mean? What was the pronunciation of Aleph before it lost its pronunciation? The, the pronunciation of Aleph back in biblical times, the pronunciation of Aleph, both in Hebrew and Aramaic, was the sound of, here goes, I, I, I pronounced the Aleph as it was pronounced in biblical times, both in Hebrew and Aramaic. Here goes, oh, did you hear it? That was it. Technically speaking, this is called a glottal stop. And it's more or less impossible to hear. Uh, a glottal stop is, 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 is very, very, very difficult to hear. It's so soft. But in English, in English, we use the glottal stop in careful pronunciation of certain words. Uh, consider for a moment the English word cooperate. In rapid speech, I, I pronounce the word in rapid speech cooperate co-op, cooperate, cooperate, as though there's a W between the two O's, cooperate. In point of fact, there is no W between the two O's, and in careful pronunciation of English, the word should be pronounced cooperate, cooperate. You hear the difference between cooperate and cooperate? The difference is that with the glottal stop between the two O's, there's a moment of silence. Cooperate, cooperate. It's that moment of silence, which is the Aleph. If I drop the moment of silence, if I drop the sound of the Aleph from the word cooperate, I end up just blending the two O's together, and you get cooperate, cooperate. Now, this is true. Uh, many languages uh, uh, use the glottal stop. Uh, in, in German, for example, there's a difference between... Uh, uh, in German, for example, if you, if you, if you, antworten in German means to answer, beantworten uh, is to answer someone, but it, it is a, a, a momentary a moment of silence between the first and the second syllable, beantworten, beantworten. Uh, the, the silence is produced with the glottis. Everyone's got a glottis, uh, uh, and you can use the muscles of your throat to close the glottis, using the muscles of your throat to close the glottis stops the air from coming through the lungs through your mouth, and by closing your 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 throat, that's how you make the silence. If if you put your hand on your throat and you pronounce the word carefully, you'll feel yourself doing it. Cooperate, cooperate, cooperate. You, 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 you stop the air coming out for a moment of silence by uh, closing the muscles in the glottis, blocking uh, the flow of air coming out. That's why it's called a glottal stop. You use the muscles in the glottis to stop the flow of air, and that's a moment of silence. That was the old pronunciation of ka'em, he is standing, ka'em. And now just as in English, in rapid speech, we lose the glottal stop. And instead of co cooperate, we say cooperate. Uh, similarly, in Aramaic, in rapid speech, in the course of time, they dropped the pronunciation of the Aleph. And by the time you get down to a Talmudic Aramaic, uh, the word ka'em, ka'em, two syllables, ka'em, with a bit of silence between the two syllables, ka'em. By the time you get down to, bim, bim, to a Talmudic times, the, the Aleph was totally lost. And the two syllables just blended together, like cooperate, just blended together, and ka'em became kayem, kayem, and they began to spell it with yud instead of an aleph, kayem, kayem, as though there's a yud in the word. Now, of course, in the, in the Talmudic Aramaic, they tended to drop the last letter of just about every word. If you speak French, uh, you know, it's very common in French that, that you just don't pronounce the last letter of the word. 
um, in, in Talmudic Aramaic, in Babylonia, in Babylonia, not in Eretz Yisrael, but in Babylonia, it was very common to drop the last letter of words in pronunciation. And therefore, in the Babylonian Talmud, they, they often didn't spell the last letter. They just dropped the last letter uh, from spelling as well. And therefore, Ka'em became Kayem, and Kayem lost its final mem and became Kaye, which was spelled Kaye, or just Ka, or Ka as a prefix. And therefore, Ka as a prefix in Aramaic just means he is standing, and it's extremely common because, as we saw earlier, it's impossible to tell the present tense from the past tense just by looking at how a word is spelled. Katev can mean he is spelling. He is he, katev, he is writing. Or, or katav, spelled exactly the same way, means he wrote. In order to emphasize this present tense, they frequently added the word ka'im, he is standing and writing. Not that he's literally standing, but indicating that he's doing it now, present tense, and therefore a ka, meaning he is standing, or ka as a prefix, meaning he is standing, is frequently added to the beginning of a verb just to indicate that it's the present tense. He is standing and writing, not literally standing, but it means he's doing it now. So you know it's a present tense verb and not a past tense verb. In, uh, in the Talmudic text, we uh, have uh, uh, the word uh, uh, tekum. It will stand. The question will stand as the question has no answer. Let the question stand. Let it stand, tekum, uh, which, of course, comes from takum. Uh, it lost its final mem. And uh, we end up with teku. No, no, yeah, no, teku means the question shall stand. Let the question stand. Let the question stand. That is, we don't have an answer for it. That's all it means. The uh, teku, that's an Arabic, simple Arabic word. The, um, uh, now, let's continue in the verse. You remember uh, the, the, the dream interpreters said to the king, Tell the dream to your servants. Now, now let's talk about the endings, which go on nouns for my servant, your servant, his servant, and all these endings that go, that go on, uh, on nouns to indicate uh, whose servant it is. In Hebrew, these are called kinuye kinyan, the endings, the, the, the possessive endings. Well, it, it's very similar to Hebrew, but with some minor differences, which, which are very important to pay attention to. Uh, Evan is a servant, both in Hebrew and Aramaic. In Hebrew, uh, Avdi, my servant. In Aramaic, exactly the same, Avdi, my servant. Your servant, in Hebrew, Avdecha. In Aramaic, Avdach, spelled the same, but pronounced differently, Avdach, your servant. The, uh, uh, if you is a woman, we're speaking to a woman and saying your servant, Avdech, in Hebrew, your servant, when speaking to a woman. Avdechi, uh, your servant, when speaking to a woman in Aramaic. And in unvocalized texts, if you don't have the vowels written, they would usually add an extra yud uh, for Avdechi in Aramaic. His servant, Avdo, in Hebrew. Avde in Aramaic. And again, when writing in an unvocalized text, if you're not adding the vowels, avde would be spelled with an extra yud in it. So avdo in Hebrew for his servant, avde for his servant in Aramaic. Uh, avda, her servant, avda, her servant, difference between a kamatz and a patach, which is uh, not heard at all in modern Israeli pronunciation. Uh, avdenu, our servants, uh, Avdana in Aramaic, spelled the same, but of course you're never going to get a Yud between the Dawid and the Nun in Avdana, because it's not Avdena, it's Avdana, Avdenu in Hebrew, Avdana in Aramaic. Your servants, when speaking to several men, Avdechem in Aramaic, uh, Avadchom, Avadchom. 
Now, now I've got home your your servants in some Talmudic texts. The final letter gets dropped, and therefore in Talmudic texts it's avad cho, avad cho for your servants. The final mem being commonly dropped in Babylonian Talmudic texts. Uh, when speaking to several women, which is, doesn't come up very often in the literature, but does come up here and there, uh, your servants. When speaking to several women, and it's an extremely rare form in Aramaic, uh, your servants. When speaking to several women, I suppose that in Babylonia they dropped the final nun, I suppose, but there's not a single example in the whole of Babylonian uh, uh, Aramaic literature of anyone speaking about your servants when speaking to several women. So, although I suppose the final nun was dropped and in spelling would be replaced by a yud, I suppose that's how they would speak. It just never occurs in the whole of Babylonian Aramaic literature that anyone's, anyone is speaking to several women and uses the word uh, uh, your servants. So, it's uh, just a guess that they dropped the final nun there. Their servants, uh, Avdam, um, uh, their servant, uh, one, we're talking about singular, their servant, one, their servant in Hebrew, Avdam, uh, Avad Hon, Avad Hom in Aramaic, and again, the final mem is dropped in Talmudic texts, in Babylonian texts, uh, their servant, if, it's, if they are women, Avdam, and in uh, Aramaic, uh, Avdahain. Uh, uh, Avda of the hain for their for their their servants if they are women and then there there too I suppose they dropped the final noon in Babylonia but there's not a single example uh, of uh, of speaking about their servants where there are more than one woman involved in the whole of the literature so uh, I'm not definitively sure about how they whether or not they dropped the noon but probably they did in any event we're quite familiar with some of these forms. Yitkadash uh, Shemei Rabbah, may his name uh, uh, be be sanctified. Shmei uh, in Aramaic, his name. Shmei, his name in Hebrew. Shmo uh, in in Aramaic. Shmei, his name. And of course, in unvocalized texts without without vowels, there'd be an extra yud added between the mem and the hey. Uh, Yamlich. Malchute, may he cause his kingdom to reign, his kingdom, Malchut, his kingdom, uh, uh, Malchut, uh, Malchuta, the kingdom, uh, Malchute, his kingdom. And again, with an unvocalized text, one would expect a, uh, an extra yud between the taf and the he. And uh, in my uh, slovenly uh, typing, I forgot to put a dot in the final he. There should be a dot in the final hay because uh, when, when, when the final hay gets a dot in it, it's called a mopic, either in Hebrew or in Aramaic, that means the hay is supposed to be pronounced as usual. Shmeh. Uh, Shmeh. Uh, You're supposed to pronounce the hay at the end. Malchuteh. You're supposed to pronounce the hay at the end. Of course, uh, nowadays no one does. And, uh, well, uh, uh, you'll sound very peculiar if you try to use the old pronunciation. Those are the singular forms. Uh, the plural forms for servants are as follows. Avadai, my servants. Avdai, my servants. Yeah, well, 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 when we speak, speak about verb forms, we'll get to the difference between Yitkadash and Yitkadesh. But now we're speaking about nouns today. So let's concentrate on the nouns. Uh, 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 Avdecha, your servants. Avdach, your servants. Now you'll notice that in, in Avdach, there's a yud there, which is simply not pronounced. Uh, it's called a mkriya, is a technical name for it, a letter which is not pronounced. The only reason the, the yud is added in Avdach is so it should look different from the singular. On the previous screen, we had the singular Avdach, your servant. Now we have Avdach, pronounced exactly the same, for your servants. The yud would be added to indicate that it's servants. Uh, avadayach, your, your servants, when speaking to a woman. Avdechi, avadav, his servants. Avdohi, uh, avadecha, her servants. Uh, avde, avdach, again, the yud is not pronounced. 
Avdenu, our servants, Avdana, with Avdana, Avdana. The yud is not pronounced. It's uh, spelled exactly, pronounced exactly the same as the singular. Avdana, our servant. The yud added to indicate the plural. Avdechem, your servants, would be Avdechon, uh, normally with an extra yud added in unvocalized texts, and the final mem dropped. Sometimes you find a nun at the end also. Avdechen, uh, 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 your servants when speaking to women, should be Avdechen, but again, this is a form which I just invented. It doesn't actually exist in the literature. Avdechen, uh, Avdechem, their servants, Avdechom, uh, and again, the final nun, uh, the final mem would be dropped, and the yud would be added in unvocalized texts. Avdechen, their servants, when they are women, and this form also is unattested in the sources, but I suppose it was Avdehen. And these forms are familiar with us in common expressions like the Chayechon, in your lives, the Yomechon, in your days, uh, with a Nun, instead of a Mem, the older texts have Mem, the more recent texts from the Talmudic times switched the final Mem to a final Nun. Okay, so those are the basic forms of the noun. We're going to pause with this today. And next time, we'll continue going through the text of Daniel word by word, uh, learning the various forms of the uh, 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 various grammatical forms. And then we'll be able to move down into uh, uh, later rabbinic texts. Until then, I wish you a good week and eventually a Shabbat Shalom. And look forward to seeing you all again next week. Until then, Shalom Shalom.